I've got a video from a uh, Japanese student requesting I did another video on aneroid brometer movements, which is what I plan to do tonight. This is a fairly typical aneroid barometer movement. Um, they're all very much the same, really, um, apart from some very early designs. Um, and I will go through it tonight to try and explain exactly what's happening with this, how this system works. At the heart of the, the barometer is the uh, diaphragm here, which is the, the, the cylindrical um, round bellows. This is the part that actually measures the air pressure. Um, and this is the part that uh, can fail and lose its vacuum. And if it goes to air, then the, the barometer is obviously useless. Um, some of the aneroid barometers have evac evacuated all their air. Not all, not always the case, though. Sometimes they have a special gas in to attempt to compensate for um, temperature um, changes. But this one is probably more or less total vacuum inside as good as vacuum as you can get. Um, and that, that that bellows comes through to this point here and then there's a pin and you can see these pins here there's the, these two pins are connected to this spring here. This is a, a heavy, very heavy spring actually. It's very hard to actually get these pins back out because you have to put a lot of pressure on there before you can release the pins. And what that what that's doing is if that if that pin isn't there and that spring isn't there the the because the the bellows are under a vacuum the air pressure will just crush the uh, crush the bellows and they just be squashed totally down all the time so what you've got to do is you've got to compensate for the air pressure by using this big heavy spring here that will pull the bellows apart otherwise there'll be no deflection in the bellows with air pressure change so Basically, that spring is stopping the bellows from collapsing under atmospheric pressure. That's fairly straightforward. Now, the actual measurement start part of it comes in with this next linkage here, which is this main arm here. Now, this main arm here is basically taking any movement uh, from that results from air pressure change, like a slight bit of air pressure change. You can see the needle moving here, like that. Now that's showing that there's an air, been a pressure change on the bellows. Now any any air pressure change will result in the spring moving up and down and moving this lever here. Obviously, as that lever moves further and further along, it gets more and more amplified. Now you can see it moves all the way along down to this point here. So by the time there's a very small deflection on or movement on the diaphragm, there's actually quite a large swing on this arm here, relatively speaking, you probably won't see it move. If you see me pushing there, you won't actually see the arm move, but that 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 point there is actually moving when I'm pressing the uh, the diaphragm. You can't see it, it's, it's too small to see. Um, that point there is then dropped down to this point here, which is on a, uh, a pivot, and this pivot bar runs through to here. So you can see these two screws here, they're the, they are pivot points, and that point comes down to there, and then it pivots onto there. So that's another form of amplification that will amplify the movement further. Now if you look there, you'll probably see that if I apply the same amount of pressure, you can see there's a little bit of movement there. I don't know if you can see that. It's difficult to see with the... But they are pushing quite hard. Now you see that screw head? That screw head down there? That screw head there. If you watch that point there, if you apply pressure, you can see the movement there. So obviously, that's amplified through all the levering effects, on the, and the effects of levers increases the amplification. Okay, so at that point, then you come along to that shelf there where that screw is, and that point comes to this point here, and then that moves up, up to here, and that connects to the spindle shaft. And the spindle shaft is just here. Difficult to get the camera to focus where you want it to focus. And you can see here that there's the main spring that I just poked accidentally. It's a manual focus. Hopefully you've got you can see the chain link there's a fine chain here and that connects round this this shaft, the spindle of this needle, and that gives you the uh, indication of the barometric pressure. So basically it's a link, a, a concoction of amplifiers, and then a, a link th 
through to the um, to the uh, indicating needle. Um, so basically, that's all it does. Is you, all you're doing is you're taking the movement of the, uh, the the diaphragm and you're just amplifying it and then sending it into a, 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 a to a crank basically, so you can uh, see an indication on the meter. So that's basically how it works. There are a few other adjustments. Um, this is a fairly high quality uh, movement, uh, American built movement. As I say, they're all pretty similar. The screw that I was showing you earlier on, that's the um, calibration screw. And if you can see there, what that's doing is it's spreading these two pieces of, of uh, metal apart. And the further you spread them apart, the more, um, uh, sorry, the further you spread them apart, the less gain you'll get. So what that's doing is that's pushing that point from the, the main arm here to there and to this point here. So this is basically increasing the gap between this point here and this point here by adjusting one in the screw and we'll push that apart. Um, and that will give you less gain on the meter. So that's what you do. That That is the adjustment for getting the scale calibration right. So you set it in a vacuum cha chamber to 950 millibars. You make your mark on the scale. Then you relate it back to atmospheric pressure, which could be a thousand and I don't know twenty-five millibars, and it should always come back to that same point. If it's short, you need to adjust that to get it into the to the range. So that's basically your your span adjustment, your gain adjustment. There is um, on this particular um, movement an adjustment for thermal compensation. Um, some of the more domestic barometers have a uh, just a bimetal strip here. And that will compensate to a degree um, uh, for temperature change. Obviously, the metal expands and contracts, and uh, adjusting that can um, make considerable correction to that sort of error. Um, aneroid problems are particularly prone to temperature compensation. Um, a lot of the later um, diaphragms are a material called nice band C, which is very stable at temperature. I'm not sure if this one is. It may be. It might just incorporate the, the compensation as well. But as you can see, you've got two similar metals here. Basically, you move, release that clamp and you move that further down and it has more effect on one metal and less on the other. So obviously, if you move this further down, it has less effect on this particular metal. I think it's iron. And the other metal underneath, I'm not too sure which it is. Someone will uh, I'm sure tell me what it is. Um, to make a bimetal strip, but uh, that's the that's the temperature compensation. So basically, that's how it works. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and uh, I hope that was interesting. I hope I explained it a bit clearer this time. It was a bit of a rush, I must admit, last time. Uh, but uh, yeah, interesting. I think they are fantastic instruments, and they're incredibly sensitive as well. Some of them are sort of like the uh, Negretti and Sambra station barometers will detect um, the pressure difference between. Um, say the problem to sit on the on the bench here and then on the floor. I mean, it, they really are very, um, very, very sensitive indeed. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, more to come.